right, thanks. So I hope you can hear me. I'm trying to uh, look at you on a different device as well, but uh, let me look at that camera. Yeah, so it's great to, uh, well, not be there, but um, be at least on this meeting. So I want to give a little overview um, of a, a longer story that started a few decades ago. And then maybe in the end, <clears throat> in the second half, talk about something uh, that Dirk doesn't know about. So let's uh, start at the beginning. So um, 98, uh, there was this, uh, this paper coming out where this, uh, actually the abstract indicates already much of the contents. Namely, uh, Dirk then claimed to show that the process of regionalization encapsules a hop algebra structure in a natural manner. Well, that was actually a spot on, a very nice, a very nice structure that, uh, that appeared. And uh, this I want to, uh, to talk about a little bit and um, about the, uh, so what, what happened uh, quickly after that. Namely, uh, so with um, Alain Kohn, then Dirk showed that actually there was a relation with the, uh, the peak of decomposition. Uh, actually, you could capture renormalization in terms of such a peak of decomposition. And also from the start, it was actually clear that, that there was a, a rich structure that should appear for, for gaze theories. And this was already indicated at that time by papers of Grotters and Kramer and uh, Kramer del Burgo, where <coughs> uh, electrodynamics was, was used as an illustration, but of course, precisely for the point that um, what well, they are physically relevant and actually quite rich. And so with the paper called Anatomy of a Gaze Theory, which was written uh, somewhat later, this uh, gained a lot of momenta where uh, there was this expression that actually you secretly saw in this, uh, in this on the whiteboard that was just uh, shared with you. So apparently there was already discussion about this uh, even today um, about the expression for the, for the co-products on Green's functions where you use this grafting operator where you kind of insert graphs in, in one another. So I will explain it uh, in a bit more detail uh, later on. But there was this expression where you kind of uh, said that the co-product uh, sort of commutes in this sense with this grafting operator. And I'll come back to that uh, later on. But that was uh, claimed in a so-called gaze theory theorem to actually hold and also related and actually based on the identities that, uh, that implement gaze symmetries at the level of, um, of the Feynman diagrams and we do of taylor identities. And there is a kind of back and forth between this expression and the fact that the of taylor identities are compatible with the co-products. And this was, uh, can be found in, in many works uh, at the time and also later. So uh, with Karen Needs, but also with my, so myself and with Dirk and many other people that worked in this line. Um, and I'm uh, not even mentioning what happened if you, if you look at rooted trees where also such expressions were were present. So that's what the dots, uh, for instance, indicate. Now, I was uh, at the time a postdoc, and uh, that's where I met uh, also Kurush, who you just heard uh, today. And um, so we had uh, some nice meetings, I think. So uh, combinatorics and physics uh, were happening. Uh, two meetings, and we gathered them in this uh, little booklet. And I started to work on the hop algebra Feynman graphs. Uh, for, for QED, so quantum electrodynamics. And uh, that's also when I made first contact with Dirk. And um, actually a bit later, a few years later, I managed to prove that these slavnov taylor identities, they generate hop files, which of course is reflecting what Dirk had in mind in his uh, anatomy paper, uh, expressing the compatibility of renormalization with gauge symmetries. All right, so this was uh, for me the start of a fruitful period of interaction and collaboration with Dirk. So uh, let me actually, um, since, uh, so to, to lighten up the, uh, the afternoon, uh, start with some, uh, some pictures of the place we were supposed to be. So that's um, when I first, uh, or at least uh, when I went there uh, to, to visit Dirk in, uh, in IGS, um, for snow was happening quite frequently in the year after again. This we don't see anymore, in fact, uh, I think the, the climate changed so much that we don't see this so often anymore. In any case, it's a pity we're not uh, we're not there at this moment, but um, maybe this helps uh, remembering. And actually, this one is, of course, the nicer picture. So then a year later, um, Dirk actually moved to Berlin, 
and uh, which was of course a great opportunity, a lot of uh, energy and, and uh, momenta in this direction in the, at the Humboldt uh, University with the uh, from Humboldt professorship of, of Dirk. And it was a great occasion and um, we spent many, many great uh, moments also on behalf of uh, Matilda. We'd like to bring up this particular evening, Dirk, where we had a great dinner and of course we had great wine and uh, a lot also and uh, but we we still appreciate this uh, this moment so that was a, a great moment um then another thing i would like to mention and then so don't worry i will come into uh, details and so on in a moment but uh, it's just a good occasion to kind of look back on this other nice uh, place that uh, that Derek found or actually made uh, put into shape which is these schools that uh, that were done uh, taking place at Lejouche. Well, this is one of these uh, kind of uh, impressive things you can see up there. And, uh, and I think also that for the group I was having, this was a great opportunity. So uh, these are young people that, that really uh, took advantage of the situation that we had these meetings on, uh, on, on perturbative structure of quantum field theory. And so you see Matthias Sars, Koen van den Dunger, Jort Boeing, Jens de Jong, and, and they're all kind of, uh, they really um, got much inspiration from these meetings. All right, so that's um, these were uh, that was some time ago. Now let's look at the um, the stuff that uh, that we're talking about. I want to talk about today is uh, Feynman graphs, and I will start very generally where I say that uh, that I have a set of, uh, of vertices. It's v one to v k, and it could actually be uh, infinite. That is the, the core Hopf algebra that was discussed by uh, by Bloch and Kramer. Uh, some time ago, and and um, and then there's a set of types of edges. So it's like colorings on the vertices and edges, and they have to be put together compatibly. I mean, the pictures really tell you what you should be doing. So scalar phi to the third. That's this first example uh, where you just have one uh, three valent uh, vertex. Electrodynamics. That's where you have this one photon line uh, appearing next to the edges. Um, which you could, by the way, take uh, with an orientation if you wish, but I want to insist. And then um, there's this, this, this kind of rule where you put these things together in, in this way, as you all uh, well know. So but it's good to kind of get this structure together. Then uh, there's young males theory where there are actually several types of vertices, even more like with ghosts and so on. And there is also several types of edges and they can also be put together according to these rules. So the types of vertices that we have and then there's gravity, um, non-perturbative, uh, sorry, perturbative gravity, where you have like uh, the, what is endless series of, uh, of vertices and edges that appear. And then we can construct uh, graphs uh, such as the one uh, written there. So <clears throat> let's, um, let's look at what uh, we're gonna build with these and then get to the, the, the well, that's the start of this story, the Hopf algebra of Feynman graphs. This is the Kronkramer uh, Hopf algebra. So, what we look at is uh, one particle irreducible graphs. And um, th then I would like to talk about residues of graphs, which is kind of the remainder when you shrink all the interior to, uh, to a point or so. So, the residue is it's give, just giving me the type of graph. So, it's a vertex graph or an edge graph. And that's what, uh, what's indicated with this. And what we look at is the free commutative algebra, which is generated by all Feynman graphs given this set R, where I also include trees. And then in there, I could restrict to the one PI graphs with residue in this set R that I was given. Now that's uh, an example where you have actually a one particle reducible graph that, that is written here in this, uh, in this picture. And uh, that can be in M, but it's not in H, okay? And that's actually quite useful because, so if we restrict so now, let, let me first give you this map lambda. So um, actually the map is called lambda and rho in the same line, so sorry for that. So we consider a map from M to H tensor M, which I call rho. And it's defined uh, like this, where you take this sum of our subgraphs. And that's, uh, that's of course uh, the subgraphs that are responsible for possible divergencies in, in eventual amplitudes. And uh, the, the quotient by this uh, subgraph, and actually it could be several, so it's a disjoint union. That's just by shrinking that subgraph to a point, to a vertex or an edge, depending on the type of graph. And um, so this is like 
the, the co-products, except that now I define it on M. But if you restrict it to this H, so if you restrict rho to H, then it's actually the co-products uh, for the Hopf algebra H, the concrimer Hopf algebra, where this co-unit is just given by something non trivially only on an empty graph. Uh, in fact, this whole package of M and H uh, comes together by saying that M is a left H co-module algebra. So actually this, this Hopf algebra acts on M in this way, or it co-acts rather by, by the same formula rho. That is a very natural thing to consider because they are the Feynman graphs and we want to renormalize them. So <clears throat> some examples that uh, you've also are also very familiar with of this formula where I shrink these, uh, these boxes on the left-hand side and I, I explain them on the right. There's this primitive part and then there's these, these red uh, subgraphs. For instance, in the second line, you find that there's like these two pieces and their disjoint uh, union is the one that I'm taking care of on, this, uh, on the third uh, uh, term on that line. And, and then there is also the, the one in which you take a larger graph in the blue box, etc. So, but the row, if you consider that, uh, that map uh, on this, uh, this kind of glasses, then you find uh, that there is uh, not so much a primitive part, but it's actually, you only take into account the one PI graphs on the first leg of the tensor product. So that's why it's a little bit different in that case, but otherwise it's the same principle. And of course, if you try to shrink a graph, which is not in your original set of vertices or edges, then you, you better not do it. So that's what, uh, What's written in this uh, last line, All right? So let's uh, refresh your minds on how to get renormalization as this uh, kind of beak of decomposition in G. I will not uh, go in too much into detail on this uh, this beak of property, but it's it's um, what I would like to say is that if you take um, a character U Z, which is for instance given by something which is like um, a regularized Feynman amplitude. Then you could define a, a character on this Hopf algebra uh, CZ, depending also on this parameter Z, this regularizing parameter, which is defined in this way, where this T is somehow kind of projecting really onto the part which is responsible responsible for the uh, for the divergency. So it's like the the projection on a pole part, for instance. And then what you find is that if you kind of um, systematically subtract this part, like as a, in a counter term, you counter this divergence. And you end up with something which is the renormalized value R Z. That's actually finite when you put Z equals to zero. Right, so that's the, the uh, good old story of this, uh, this procedure of renormalization and Z is just the choice uh, for convenience in the, 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 the dimensional regularization, but many other possibilities exist. All right, so let's um, uh, look at this, um, why uh, uh, one remark maybe is that, uh, that what is CZ, these counter terms are defined on H, but RZ is actually defined as a map from M to C. So it's actually for all Feynman graphs that this procedure works, but the counter terms, of course, you should only take into account the one PI graphs. So that's the usual story of renormalization in quantum field theories. And is quite general now for any type of quantum field theory, any type of uh, vertices and edges. But here is uh, the interesting story of gauge theories, which actually that's, that formed the basis of, uh, of the work I did and also the work I did with, uh, with Dirk, is that if you look at, um, at, first of all, if you look at Green's functions, uh, let's say one PI Green's function, so they are actually given like this. So there's some kind of form factor, which is uh, the thing that you would typically find in Lagrangian. And then there is a part with which is multiplied in, in order to get the full uh, kind of the, 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 the quantized um, uh, uh, contribution, so the renormalized value for coupling constants or for uh, well, for the usual Green's function in, in quantum field theory. Now these GRs that I uh, have in there, they are elements in the in the Hopf algebra, so they're formal series where I take into account um, all those graphs, just sum them all 1PI graphs with the given residue, namely VI or EJ. And then there's a plus and a minus, of course. And then there's the symmetry group that you take into account. 
But now if you think about what happens for gauge theories, it's quite important that there are certain identities between these form factors, because otherwise you would never have such a gauge symmetry because that's precisely where the notion of, I mean, uh, where gauge uh, symmetry groups are acting in making sure that these relations should hold. Now the question is, actually the, it's a desire or a demand almost to say that renormalizability for gaze theories really requests that there, that this type of relation kind of persists uh, also at higher orders. So uh, for any uh, Green's function, they should hold. So if you look at this expression over, I say on the left-hand side here, so this, this, this four point function can be expressed in terms the Slavnov-Taylor identity should hold, where you say that the G, the for loop times the, the edge G is actually the square of the trivalent uh, vertex. And, and these type of identities, they're supposed to hold in order to guarantee uh, renormalizability for these theories. And then it's important that you know that they are actually, uh, they hold at the level of the Hopf algebra. So that's uh, where we, kind of were first motivated by looking for an expression for the co-products on these GRs, whether or not they're actually compatible with the co-products. And uh, of course, you would like to impose these, these, these identities at the Hopf algebra, but it should be in such a way that what you end up with is still a Hopf algebra. So you can just impose them. They should be kind of compatible with the co-products. So this is what we'll, we'll uncover and recall. So first of all, a little bit of structure of, uh, of H. So there are several gradings. There's a, a grading by loop number, which is the Betty number, decomposing H into these pieces, HL and QL is the projection. Then there's also a multi-grading by a number of vertices where I kind of count the number of vertices of a different type, so VI. And I correct for some, some, uh, some possibility that, um, that the residue is equal to that VI. Then it actually becomes a multigrading, which is, uh, kind of makes sense at the level of the Hopf algebra. So it's a grading on the Hopf algebra. So it decomposes like this. And uh, there is a nice relation between them, as usual, um, where you kind of can express the, the loop number in terms of these uh, other uh, DIs, these multigrading in this way. And also note that these are examples of connected Hopf algebras where the zeroth order is, uh, is actually just the scalars. So this is what we, what we have, this kind of package of, of gradings, which is useful later on. Now, <clears throat> if we look at an example of uh, say scalar phi to the third, there's only one type of vertex and one type of edge. Let's see what happens if you compute this co-product on these Green's functions. So then what you can do is you can, um, you can look at the elements X, which is a combination of GV and GE in this way. And together with the GEs, they generate a Hopf subalgebra in H. And that's precisely because you can show that the co-product on X is actually just uh, expressible in terms of X, uh, restricting to each loop order. And the co-product on this GE can be expressed as well in terms of GEs and X. So it means that the GE and the GV, so these two Green's functions, they generate a Hopf subalgebra in H. Now, if you think about what is the structure of that Hopf algebra, if you dualize this, remember they, they're just commutative Hopf algebra. So there's a group which is dual to this. Then you find that these are, um, that these are just uh, formal power series which are invertible um, in some lambda and, and there is a cross product with the diffeomorphisms. And in fact, what happens is this, is if you take a character on this Hopf subalgebra, which is supposed to be the element in the group, you get an invertible, invertible formal power series by, uh, by, by this expression. And then there is a, a formal diffeomorphism, which is defined like that. So it's, um, it's, it's completely kind of, um, the way to understand this is by looking at these as diffeomorphisms and as uh, these invertible formal power series. And this happens to be the structure that we will find in all cases, if we would uh, have such something like Slavnov-Taylor identities. So let's look at uh, how that works. So the, um, the structure of, uh, of H in general is like this. So it's, um, so we have um, vertices as before V1 until VK. 
and then there are these edges uh, E1 uh, until En. And for each vertex, we define such a, like a charge. So Xv is defined like this, where you just take the, the Green's function corresponding to that vertex, and you divide formally, of course, um, using the loop uh, order, for instance, to make sense of this expression, you uh, divide it by the, um, the, the edges, so the Green's functions for the edges, which are actually connected to that vertex, and then take a square root. As before, before we had uh, three over two, because it was a trivalent uh, vertex, and uh, that, that's what we ended up with. And also the one over uh, three minus two is then actually just one. So that's, um, that's the kind of the charge of the, the expression that you would get for uh, for phi to the third theory, but this is now in, in full generality. You can ask the same question. So what is the co-product on Green's functions? And you find that actually this, um, there is an expression which you can show that's an um, exercise in combinatorics. It's rather lengthy, and uh, but one can do it. Um, so the co-product on this GR uh, is actually given like this, it's GR. And then there's these powers of X, the XVs appearing. And then there is the part uh, of GR on the second leg of the tensor product, which is of multi-degree N1 to NK. Now that part, so it's, it's actually, uh, if you would take into account the multi-grading, then it's actually fine. You see that, uh, well, you, this already generates for me um, something like, um, like a subalgebra. And you can even say that the delta of XV can also be expressed like this. We have all these terms XV1 appearing again as, as before. So nothing really changes here. It's just the restructuring of the previous formula. But what, is, um, what this says is that you have the multi-degree, it's necessary to get these Hopf-Sopp algebras. But now suppose, and that's the point which will come in the next slide, is that when, um, when would I get something like a subalgebra at each loop level, because that's kind of the physically relevant uh, structure that you restrict yourself to, to XV or GV or whatever in GR at a loop order uh, L and not at this multi-degree because it's not uh, really physical to count number of vertices. So that could happen precisely when all these XVs that you see here on the, on, in, on the, on the screen, when the, when the XVIs are all identical, because then you have this formula relating the, the multi-degree, these di's that I had before, it's related to the to 2L. And then you actually find that the, the exponents of these xvi's, they combine to give you something like 2L, and then there's this other xv, so it's 2L plus one, just as with phi to the third theory. So you find that that's actually, um, well, quite important to have if you would have, want to have something like, um, so that's uh, the expression that indicates. Uh, so I, I don't know where I where you started missing me, but uh, just start uh, talking at, at some point, and then you try to catch up. So when the uh, so all these XVIs when they're equal, then actually you find that, uh, that these exponents can be combined and to be related to the to the loop number, and and then you would actually find that uh, that if you project. Um, on the second leg, then you're projecting onto, uh, um, onto the loop order. So that's what's happening. And this would indicate that you have this compatibility with, uh, with these, uh, well, you have this closed expression whenever you have these relations xvi equals xvj. So let's do that. So uh, first of all, you get this op subalgebra h prime that's in all these different, uh, it's in multi degrees. So you have to take into account different uh, couplings for all the vertices. But then um, if you would impose that the XVI and the XVJ are equal, then you actually are reducing it. And the fact that, uh, so the reason I just explained is that all these exponents uh, combine and conspire to give you twice the loop order tells you that this is actually an Hopf ideal. So it's actually closed under that expression. And, and you can find that, that what you end up with is a whole, uh, uh, the quotient is a whole algebra. And then you can conclude that the dual group is just the one that we had for phi to the third, just formal power series in one variable acting in, in different, uh, maybe for the different fields. So that's wave function realization for the N different fields. And then it's semi direct product with the diffeomorphisms. Okay, so that's, uh, that's kind of, um, 
something that uh, that that uh, that we showed some time ago. That's um, well, yeah, that's just a name attached to it. So there, there are these Slavonov Taylor identities, but I, I would like to get to the gaze theory theorem. So <clears throat> let's look at the um, the Hochschild cohomology uh, for Hopf algebras. Not to be confused with the Hochschild cohomology I will be talking about a bit later. Uh, for algebras, this is for Hopf algebras, and then you use the co-product um, to kind of uh, to to find a structure of a say a complex first of all. But but let's go slowly. So let's look at the bi algebra H, and M is an H bi co-module. So it's uh, some some left co-action and a right co-action, which are co-commuting, just uh, co everything. Uh, what you know from uh, from group actions, and then. Um, you have row L, row R. These are the, the left and the right co-action. And what I will, will be looking at is um, so like co-chains in this case. There will be linear maps phi from M into the n-fold um, tensor product of H. So <clears throat> on that, we can define a map. That's the Hochschild co-boundary map B which gives you uh, from, it goes from CN to CN plus one. And it's actually what you do is you take the, the co-product in between the different components that you could, uh, that you have in H to the N and on M you use the uh, row L and the row R. So this is what you end up with. So after phi, so after evaluating with respect to phi, what you end up with is something which is in H to the N on which you can apply in the ith term, you can apply the co-product and then it gets to h tensor n plus one. So that's this co-product in the ith factor. And then on the, as I said, the rho l and rho r are used uh, as the first and the last term. And the co-associativity of delta of the co-product actually implies that b squared is equal to zero. It's just a consideration of the minus signs that you find over there. So that means that I can define cohomology groups, which are the Hochschild cohomology of the bi-algebra or Hopf algebra, H uh, with values in M. And so these are precisely the cohomology of this complex. So let's see um, how this is relevant for what uh, we've been doing. Well, I actually saw already an expression that is very similar to, uh, to what I'm about to, to tell you now. In fact, it's the same. Is that if uh, you consider M, um, as H, a co-module over itself, and you take as a left co-action just the co-products, but on the right you take uh, the co-products uh, composed with the identity times the co-units. Then you get a, a Hochschild cohomology group, which is denoted by H H epsilon, which was already present in the early uh, papers of Kohn and Kramer. It was actually uh, relevant for these uh, when you look at, at rooted trees, that that's actually the case. That's the structure underlying this. And then you find that um, that to be, for instance, a one co-cycle, an off-shield one co-cycle, it means that delta of phi, that's a representative phi, is equal to identity times phi after delta plus phi times uh, a one, where this means just plugging in a one. And the, um, the picture you saw on the whiteboard in the little break was precisely telling you that this B plus gamma for a primitive graph, so the grafting operator is a Hochschild co-cycle of degree one. So that's precisely this formula over here. It tells you that, so the grafting operator just takes a primitive graph gamma and it plugs in graphs. Actually, that's the, uh, the argument is xkr, which is the Green's function with respect to r for the vertex or the edge r, and then 2k powers of xv. And the point is that this actually holds Whenever you impose these xv1 and xv2, all these um, these charges to be equal, so you have to impose the Slavonov Taylor identities in order to show this, and that was the content of um, the gauge theory theorem. Is actually uh, precisely that relation between these two two aspects. So this Hopf ideals on the one side, the algebraic structure, and this 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 uh, Hochschild cohomology, which is at place at this uh, in this theorem. So <clears throat> now, of course, this extends when you, uh, when you sum over all primitive graphs of a certain loop order and a certain residue, then you still have that property because it was just a linear uh, property. And then you find that um, 
that you can actually show the gauge theory theorem that, uh, that Dirk uh, posed uh, back in 2005 in the preprint and pretty year later. Uh, it was that in the quotient Hopf algebra, first of all, you find that uh, you can generate all the Green's functions by just um, doing this grafting all the time in a kind of uh, in, in the in the right way. Then you have this property that I just showed you for primitive graphs gamma that extends to B plus KR, so a certain uh, vertex type and certain loop order. You can actually do that, and you find that you actually, uh, if you look at uh, one and two together. You say that, well, then I can just plug in GR at that place at loop order K. And then the co-product on that is just expressible in terms of the thing I started with, namely polynomials in G from the first leg, but times the Green's function for the same type R, uh, same residue, but at the lower loop order. And that's precisely the, uh, the essence of, of this, uh, this story is that if you impose these slav teller identities, then you have that property of this uh, of this Hochschild co cycle, and then you actually find that the, the Hopf algebra generated by these GRs is actually um, the Hopf sub algebra is, uh, is actually uh, 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 makes sense on this GRK. All right, so that was um, the story as we as we had it. That was uh, so. This is this can be uh, written uh, or read in the uh, in a paper I wrote. Uh, a little bit later where I just gathered and you can also get all the references to all the papers. But I would like to um, maybe tell something, as I said, uh, that, uh, that Derek may not know uh, because this he all knows uh, for you know, very well for a very long time. So let's uh, talk about uh, uh, the unexpected influence on non-cognitive geometry that, uh, that Dirk had, even though it's not really unexpected in the sense that he was in beer, so it was uh, kind of uh, hard to not have that. But what I want to say with this, what I want to tell with this is that, that, um, that uh, as far as I uh, remember, I've never seen Dirk working on, uh, on, on non-cognitive geometry in the sense of, uh, of spectral triples or so, but uh, with a, a strong interest of course, in these developments, and for me, it was an inspiration and uh, motivation to actually uncover the field theories in, in non-commutative geometry as they appear, uh, especially what is the, um, the renormalizability properties, or how are they defined, and um, are they actually physically uh, viable, in a sense. So let me uh, tell a little bit about this. So first of all, that's a story that uh, one probably should not be telling in Buer, uh, but but let me still do it since we're now, uh, anyways, all online. So um, so this is uh, um, this notion of non-commutative geometry is is based on an on an algebra of coordinates. So you replace kind of spaces by algebras of coordinates. It could be non-commutative. Then um, we take a generalization of a Dirac operator in D, where you actually just um, forget about all the kind of geometric structure that was used to define the Dirac operator, but only remember the analytical properties, like self-adjoinedness and some, some compactness of the resolve. And so all kinds of things that you can de derive, you can actually just um, isolate and abstract and, and work with that uh, by itself, and then allow a lot more and also some more in the direction of non-commutative and geometry, non-commutative spaces. So these algebra and operator, they come together uh, by uh, in a Hilbert space where they act as, as operators. So the algebra is uh, acting as bounded operators and the operator is an unbounded operator with suitable properties. So I won't dwell on the details on this because that's um, a little bit an, uh, outside of also the, the theme of this meeting. But what I would like to get to is how these physical applications come about. So, uh, well, this is good to keep in mind. So that's just an example where you take like functions on R4, you take spinors on R4, on which you act, but just point-wise multiplication, and then the Dirac operator acts on these, uh, these spinors as well, as it was defined like that, or these smooth spinors, and uh, this extends as an unbounded operator on this Hilbert space. But um, the, the kind of the origin of, of field theories or gauge theories is the following. Is that what you can do is you can um, take your your D, this Dirac operator, and you can fluctuate it. And these fluctuations can be driven by the algebra. And, and this is the only thing kind of the ingredient I want to take is that um, 
that if you uh, if you look at this um, uh, these expressions like v, it's it's written like this series, a j and then uh, d commutator b j, then what you find is that um, uh, the, so the a j and the b j they are elements in the algebra. And what I do is I construct something like a one form with them by taking this uh, differential with respect to D. And um, what I do is I just add them to D in such a way that the result is still self adjoins But that's kind of the sort of the V is supposed to be thought of as a gauge field or a potential that you add to D. And, <clears throat> oh, sorry, I should also try to maybe, sorry about that. So um, here, the um, you get this 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 fluctuation of d, so the geometry, the rock operator is fluctuated like that. But now I want to look at uh, action functionals, and what I will be looking at is uh, the following: the spectral action that was introduced uh, also about uh, ninety eight. So it's Chamsudin and Kohn that it is ninety seven, ninety eight. So it's, it's almost in parallel where you look at uh, the physics that you could try to, uh, that you could get from this functional by looking at, at it as a functional on V. So you vary V, this, this inner fluctuation, and you look at this action functional as if it were an action functional in physics. So this is what I, uh, what I took serious and I looked at it uh, for, for several years, also several decades even. Um, to look at the structure of that uh, that action functional, and what um, what I in particular try to understand is the structure it has, and what kind of renormalizability properties it has. So, <clears throat> first thing that uh, that I uh, actually developed while visiting Bu is is the following formula. So you can look at the um, the expansion. It's like a Taylor expansion of this, uh, this action functional as a functional of V, where you, where you end up with uh, the formula I wrote here, where you take contour integration. Also, the details are not so important. It's, um, it's mainly the structure that you get when you look at these, uh, these, these resolvents, z minus d to the minus 1. And then it's a kind of a multiplied by V, and that's taken to the nth power. And that's actually my Taylor expansion of the spectral action functional. And the dependence on f is uh, this function f, which is like a cutoff function, is precisely in this uh, in this contour integration. Now, what I uh, I'm doing I'm currently doing with uh, my PhD student Turn van Nuland is the following: is that um, we we try to understand a little bit better the structure of these terms. And the first thing uh, we're doing is for well let let's write this in terms of so-called uh, well. Can call them just brackets, so v1, v2, until vn. They can be put in this this contour integration, so under the trace. And um, then you can look at, uh, say, you try to define uh, Hochschild co-chains, which right now are for the algebra structure. So what we do is we take um, it's like n plus one linear functionals, so it's multilinear functionals say in n plus one variables to C. So that's my phi, uh, my phi n, and and so I put in these elements in the algebra, and what you find is uh, so what I used to define them was exactly these commutators with d in there. What you can show precisely because of this formula and the fact that I have these resolvents uh, of d appearing there, that you find that if you take now the Hochschild differential, but now for the algebra structure, so it's not using the co-product but the, the product in the algebra, then you find that first of all, that bio, uh, B of phi n is equal to phi n plus one for an odd n. And for the even n's, we find that phi n are actually Hochschild co-cycles. So that's just, uh, also if you know a little bit about this, it's not so, uh, so, so much of a surprise, but it still is a very nice structure. So what we can try to do is understand a little bit uh, how, this, uh, how these terms uh, can be written in terms of these phi n's. So let's do that. So because the first things that you find is that the first uh, few terms in the expansion, we find that um, that the a d b, which is just phi one evaluated on a comma b, which is written like this in terms of an integral over the universal differential one form a. So it's a d b, and it's universal in the sense that uh, that any other differential can be derived from it, or as a quotient, it appears. In particular, the one with the commutators with D. 
So you have this ADB, this universal differential one form. That's a very much algebraic object. It's integrated against these phi one and it's integrated when you square it against phi two. And these are the terms that appear in the expansion where you take, uh, where you just look at the, the terms that, um, that, that pop up. The left-hand side is very simple, but they are precisely the ones that, that kind of give me the Taylor expansion of this, um, this action functional. Now, what you find is that, um, <clears throat> that here is the recollection of these terms to say the first few is that if you take uh, say look at the, the ones which are with respect to phi two we can rewrite them um, kind of take into account the phi three or the phi one as we said before is that little b of phi one is actually phi two so you can actually manipulate there with these uh, these ingredients and this is what we did and you find that um, that you can combine these terms in such a way that that you can recognize something like a curvature so it's like da plus a squared which is the curvature of a that's integrated against phi two. And then there's dA plus A squared squared. So the curvature is squared against phi four. And this actually continues. So what you find is that, um, first of all, you get these uh, integrals of the curvature and the curvature squared, curvature to the, th to the third term, to the third power is integrated against these even uh, uh, Hochschild co-cycles. But then you find that the other ones so the A, and then there's the other term appearing, which is ADA plus two third A to the third, which is also ring a bell, what kind of expression that is. And then there's another one uh, integrated against psi five, which is ADA squared plus three thirds, uh, three halves A to the third DA. Well, it doesn't really matter what it is, unless you know what I'm talking about, is that these terms, these, these forms that appear here, which are universal forms, are actually um, uh, well known. So the first one are just, the young mills terms in the sense that they are uh, powers of the you know, of the curvature they are integrated integrated against even Hochschild co cycles phi two phi four and phi six but the other terms are churn simons forms of order one three and five and they are integrated against odd cyclic co cycles so in fact that's a structure that is uh, a bit more sophisticated than just Hochschild. it's um it's actually Hochschild would correspond to something like taking integrals and cyclic co-cycles is something more like a DRAM cohomology. So you use something like um, DRAM homology, if you wish, uh, to, uh, to integrate against. Now, the, um, if you look at the scale invariant part of the spectral action, this, this, this was already, so that's a part of this, was uncovered uh, uh, by Shamsinin and Kohn. But what we found now is that this actually persists not just at all levels of the spectral action, but also at all orders in the perturbation. So what you find, and that's the structure we have, is that first of all, we define this churn simons form of degree two n minus one, which is given like this. And um, the, the final result is that if you um, take this f is da plus a squared, and you take this churn simons forms of this degree, then you, uh, then you conclude that the, the, the closed expression that you find for the Taylor expansion of the spectral action is just in terms of powers of, of, of the curvature, f to the k plus, uh, plus one, that's integrated against this, um, this even co-cycle. And then there's this churn simons form, which is integrated against this cyclic co-cycle. So it's a very simple and basic form, but that's it. So there's no other term. So all the examples that you could generate, you could think of, they should all be of that form, where the kind of the freedom is in the form of these phi and psi, which depend of course, on the D I started with. So that's um, actually what I want to end with is that, uh, so this is the same expression. And uh, what it tells me is that, uh, that this very simple structure of the spectral action where you just encounter these two forms, this, this is the moment to, to look at, uh, to a serious study of, of the gauge structure of this field theory. Because now you may wonder, well, this is kind of restrictive but you also know that counter terms are restrictive. So when you look at BRST symmetry, it should be possible to kind of tell me what should be the kind of the BRST invariance of the counter term or the gauge invariance of these terms. Can I actually uh, incorporate them in terms of the structure that I started with and kind of have a running or a, a renormalization going on uh, in these Hochschild and these cyclic co-cycles. So that's what's, uh, what, what we're doing uh, right now, but for, uh, for this moment today, 
I, let me just thank uh, Dirk for his continuing inspiration also in this, uh, this field of non community geometry. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thanks, Walter. Thank you. Um, that, that was a surprise indeed. Uh, I had not expected Dirk to, to venture so, so deeply into non commutative geometry. Um, Neither have I, honestly speaking. <laughs> but thanks for finding something you could do with it. So do you, do you see a role of co-ideals or anything when you just go at BLT? Do you see a similar structure coming up? Well, the, the thing, the, the, the connection, but so for instance, BRST at the level of Lagrangian and um, the fact that you look at, uh, at flows which respect that invariance, that's of course telling you, indicating a subgroup. Yep. That's the kind of the understanding of the, uh, the ideals, as you know. Mm -hmm. So that's maybe a, a link, but uh, for now, I mean, it's, uh, so there's always this, this thing about BRST invariance taking place at the, at the classical Lagrangian level. Whereas yep. it's much more interesting actually to look at it. Uh, I mean, in fact, this is what I learned from you probably is that, that you should look at this uh, more from the, uh, uh, at the level of, on the open space level. Yep. So that's yep. where you should be looking at this. So, but that's all um, to be uncovered. So for yep. instance, if you look at, uh, so non-commutative geometry and it's kind of, it's attempts to move this into, um, into, into a quantum theory, quantum field theory then you could say something maybe about the fermionic structure where you try to uh, do some kind of Hilbert space quantization of that. But then the bosonic part is always the issue. So you end up with this Lagrangian, which is very difficult for the bosonic uh, components. And then you have to deal with that. So that's still uh, open, so. Okay, thanks. Uh, I have one quick question since you mentioned PRST. Uh, recently, I, I've seen a lot of uh, work on, on formulating BRST and, and kind of L-infinity uh, algebraic language. And I was wondering from this Hochschild and, and co-cycle point of view, is there any connection between these two? Does, does one mean something in terms of the other? Do you have a feeling? Yeah, so there is actually, uh, they're closely related. So, uh, but, but that's uh, even before L-infinity because that would be more on the kind of BV side, I would say. Yeah. So Batalin Milkovichki, then, then you have that connection. But just uh, if you look at BRST, then so what you usually do, but this is uh, say Weinberg style, so it's, it's, uh, it's a bit older, is that you look at um, so BRST invariant functional, so you try to kind of compute the BRST cohomology. But then in certain cases, you can actually relate, relate this to Lie algebra cohomology, which you can typically compute. Mm -hmm. And then you can quickly kind of uh, conclude that, that the counter terms are of that type. But Lie algebra cohomology is easily related to Hochschild cohomology of the universal enveloping algebra. So then you're home. <laughs> but it's, it's not of the same type as I'm discussing here. So this yeah, is yeah. a different algebra is the, well, I mean, it, it could be a similar algebra, but it's really the ghost sector that drives this part of the story. So it's yep. the Lie algebra cohomology on, the, on that part. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Walter. Thanks. Um, I see no further questions at the moment, so, so let's thank Walter again. <laughs>